This is Comic Geek Speak episode 1818, a conversation with Ron Mars. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Ian Levinstein. And I'm Chris Everly. I think I feel like Chris, you missed your life as a prop comedian. I use props in the classroom all the time. I've got a wooden katana, I've got a wiffle ball bat, I've got masks, I've got bobbleheads, anything to keep the students awake, and myself for that matter. Nice, nice. Uh, well, welcome one and all to the show. Uh, and uh, those of you on video, it's already been spoiled, but uh, we are joined uh, tonight uh, by the man who uh, we introed in the intro, uh, man who's been working in comics for many a year at this point uh, and uh, has tackled uh, everything from Green Lantern to Silver Surfer to Genus Vell, one of my favorite characters of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Ron Mars. Ron, how's it doing? How's it going tonight? Welcome. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, our pleasure. And uh, and those of you who, who are comic geek speak historians, I will point out Ron's first appearance on the show was back in episode one eighty three, September twenty sixth, two thousand six, an indie challenge episode uh, where uh, you were promoting Russian Sunset. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Hickman was also on that episode promoting Nightly News. <laughs> wow. Uh, and, you know, to uh, to be frank about it, uh, Russian Sunset never came out and Nightly News did. Wow. <laughs> um, although um, now we've got uh, now we've got an entire issue of Russian Sunset drawn and sitting in a drawer. So someday. Oh, wow. Hey, someday, hey when, when, the, when, when the time is right. Someday probably sooner than later that will see the light of day but you know I, I would like to think that I'm a better writer 15 years on than I was then so it's going to be good now I 100 percent <laughs> guarantee it and it was in no way the fault of comic geek speak that this issue didn't come out I made that perfectly clear to everybody listening <laughs> oh boy all right. Well, before we get into the fe the, the festivities here, uh, and uh, and they will be festive. Uh, just a quick reminder uh, that the show is, as always, sponsored by you, the listeners, over at Comic Geek Speak uh, Patreon at patreoncom slash Speak. Uh, we've got 119 patrons giving us 343 dollars a month at the moment, and uh, you are the ones that keep this show going. And uh, we very much appreciate all the continued support uh, that you give to the show. You're awesome, and uh, we wouldn't be here without you. So patreon.com slash comic geek speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. You. I forgot to do the point. You. There we go. All right. So, Ron, uh, <laughs> considering that it's been, you know, many a year, I think the last time you were on was 2012. Um, I'm going to start you off with a question that we ask all creators here on Comic Geek Speak uh, when they come on the show. Uh, what first got you in the comics uh, growing up uh, as a kid? What first got you into the genre? Um, as a little kid, there was a box of old comics in our basement that um, were there from my older brother. Um, my older brother was a fair bit older than I was. So they were Silver Age Marvels, uh, along with some Magnus robot fighter, I think. I didn't wow. know why that guy was running around in a red skirt, but it seemed okay. <laughs> um, and, um, and other odds and ends, but it was mostly, you know, like classic Marvel stuff, early Spider-Man and Kirby, um, Avengers, FF, um, back in the days of tales of suspense cap and iron man didn't even have their own books um so like old you know old moldering comics and those things were just fascinating to me so those were the first comics ever um i ever encountered and then when i got older and you know my mother would bring me to the grocery store or whatever i could 
pick out a few comics to you know keep me occupied for for the next couple of hours <laughs> it's funny you mentioned grocery stores because uh i guess the closest we come to that now would be walmart having comics uh as i was i was just at one the other day and uh, and found that they still have uh, uh the bundles there of uh, of dc stuff uh, for for people to purchase, so that's I guess as close as we come now to the uh, to the you know the the supermarket checkout comics of old. Yeah, I mean that's how I know I've been in the business a long time. I remember when there was a newsstand, and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like actually bought books off the newsstand, um, mm -hmm. or what we you know what we referred to collectively as a newsstand. But yep, yeah, I mean I I didn't even know such a thing as a comic store existed until I was in college. Um, I just bought comics off of a spinner rack and a convenience store, convenience store, deli, and uh, the supermarket were were the places I haunted to see see what issues were there because you couldn't count on getting the next issue of whatever you know. I was a big Avengers and X Men fan at that point. You couldn't count on those issues being there. Um, maybe they were sold out. Uh, maybe they weren't out yet. So. You just kind of took pot luck, which which I look back on now and just I think it was kind of the coolest thing ever because you had a couple of bucks in your pocket and you just picked whatever looked good. Um, so I got introduced to a bunch of different things uh, because I couldn't go to a comic shop and get exactly what I wanted. I just got whatever was around. And I mean, that's that's a great way to get into it when you think about it, because I mean, uh, you're 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 bound to pick up new and interesting things that way. You know, I mean, I mean, sure, it might be hard to to stay current on on a on a storyline, but you at least get your options uh, uh, there one way or the other. Yeah, it was kind of a you know, it was kind of a smorgasbord. Uh, so I think I got exposed to a lot of different stuff that otherwise I wouldn't have normally been and, and probably helped instill the love of, of comics in me in general, um, because it was just, it wasn't like, oh, I, you know, I need those men issues. It was, I needed comics. I needed the kind of, you know, it was delivery mechanism for me. Definitely. I had, I had the exact same experience. Uh, I'm not sure how old you are, Ron, I'm 48, but same experience. I learned everything from Conan to the Micronauts to Sergeant Rock, which I never would have discovered Otherwise, because like you said, it was such a variety and because it was hit or miss what was what was being distributed to these different stores, every time I went in there it was something different and it definitely made the, the, enjoying the hobby that much richer. Yeah, I think um, I think I was having this conversation on Twitter, you know, a while ago, but just that concept that, you know, sort of guys of our generation get because we, you know, we had to take potluck that I think is is very different from the generations that came behind us and particularly, you know, people are discovering now because you can get literally any issue you want at the press of a button. Um, for us, it was just like, I mean, there were, there was no such thing as trade paperbacks. Um, collections did not exist for the mo most part, just the, you know, Mar Marvel's secret origins and son of secret origins and bring on the bad guys. Like comics were comics, they weren't books. So, um, so yeah, if you, you know, you had to, uh, I mean, I eventually learned that there were such things as comic stores and, and, um, you know, even flea markets where people set up and, and sold back issues. So the, the sense of discovery, um, that I took away from all that stuff is still pretty precious to me. Um, and I don't know that there's as much of that now because everything's so, uh, so easily within reach. Yeah, I, I I know that. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 younger. I'm I'm only 37. But uh, when I was when I first started reading comics, um, funny enough, one of the first comics that I specifically remember buying of yours uh, was from a pharmacy down the block from my dad's dog grooming shop in Regal Park, Queens. Um, and and it was you know it just happened to be a pharmacy that had like a whole like rack full of of recent comics. Um, and it was Green Lantern number 100. Um, I, I got drawn by the fact that there were two Green Lanterns on, on the cover. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into. And my mind could have went one of two directions from that after that. You know, I could have been a Hal guy or I could have been a Kyle guy because I literally got the option right there from both of them. Um, as, uh, you know, that was the issue where, you know, they quote unquote met for the first time as it was, uh, a, a travel through time uh, in, in that way with, with Hal winding up in the present. Um, and I very much became a Kyle Rayner fan that day. Um, and I, I am to this day and Kyle 
is one of my favorite comic book characters for many a reason. Um, and and you you gave me that foot in the door, man. Uh, <laughs> I, I I will I will always appreciate you for that. Uh, and it really was also my foot in the door to DC Comics because I I hadn't really read much DC before then, and it got me very interested in you know going for back issues wherever I could, and you know getting into the the other guys because I was a Marvel guy before that. Well, I, I feel like the you know I feel like the old Templar Knight and Last Crusade, and I I get to tell you <laughs> it goes wisely. <laughs> and also also wisely because you know we weren't publishing hal jordan comics at the time so exactly i exactly. only had one choice when it, when you get right down to it um, i would have I been going for some really really back issues there so <laughs> um well you know for for me when i took over green lantern and we you know we uh we shuffled hal off and, and brought in kyle um that was for me my sort of dc comics discovery too because mm -hmm. uh, I grew up reading mostly Marvel books as a kid, um, which probably has something to do why with why Kyle is sort of more of a a, a Marvel archetype character than a than a right. DC archetype character. Um, and um, so when I got a hold of the book, I you know I wanted to go explore and play with a bunch of the toys and have a bunch of different uh, characters come in and out of the book and. And I certainly did that for the first few years. It was, you know, Titans and Batman, Shazam, Wonder Woman all showed up, mm -hmm. um, Superman, obviously. Um, so I got to, you know, I got to play with all the stuff that I wasn't, you know, I was obviously familiar with all of those characters as a kid. And, um, and as a, you know, once I was a professional, obviously I was paying attention to that stuff, but um, I didn't have the, you know, sort of the, the, the teenage attachment to any of those characters because I really really didn't read them for the most part um, as a kid. Uh, I read I read Teen Titans um, uh -huh. when Perez and, and Wolfman were doing it because because it was a very Marvel style book basically. <laughs> um, and I read Batman because it's Batman. Um, but other than that, I was not really well versed in the DC universe at all um, when I was just reading books and. Um, so I, you know, I felt like a kid in a candy store when I got over to DC and I wanted to, wanted to get my hands on everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ron, do you think not having that background actually helped you as a writer when it came to crafting those stories? Did it make you more free in a sense? Yeah, like I do. Like, um, I think you, you tend to, um, come at things with a fresher perspective if you don't have baggage, um, uh, you know, I had, you know, I looked at Green Lantern comics and when, when Green Lantern was relaunched um, with the house, you know, the house series that I eventually took over, mm -hmm. I read the book for like a year or so. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't stuff that I was attached to in that sense. So I think very often when you take, take over a book, if you're too close to it, you know, you don't make the best decisions. Um, you don't make, uh, you make, decisions with your heart not your head um and i've been in that position where i was you know ended up on a book that that i really man i love this character um w you know whoever that character happened to be and i think it you know it was not as uh freeing for me to like i took over green lantern and i you know i hadn't read that many green lantern issues mm -hmm. uh in my life obviously i read to get up to speed but um, it was not a it was not a character that I had uh, great affection for over any others. Um, same thing with Witchblade when I took that over. I had frankly only looked at Witchblade issues after they sent me a whole box of them <laughs> to see if I wanted to take over the uh, take over the the writing. Um, and I think because of that, I I approached it probably with a more um, I, I approached it with more perspective than you know as if i had been reading it for seven years or whatever um i could kind of go through the issues and go through the storylines and see what i thought worked and what i thought didn't work and kind of kind of call the things about it that um would appeal to me as a writer um only rather than uh sort of being attached to the things that i that i really had affection for as a reader you you mentioned storylines, and I and uh, immediately my mind went to the fact that uh, you know the Emerald Twilight that we got wasn't necessarily the Emerald Twilight that DC originally had planned out. I know there there were uh, there were advertisements for uh, what looked like a very very different story. Uh, oh yeah, 
that were ran before before you know before you came in there and and did it were you involved at all in the process before that or or after they decided to uh, to shift to something different <laughs> no i was i was not my involvement in that process um included looking at whatever pages had been drawn from that yeah. story mm -hmm. um just as a curiosity oh yeah here's here's the stuff you know here's pages that have been drawn for issues not sure if it was 48 49 and 50 or just 48, um off the bat but um that was the direction the book was going to go and then dc decided that that was not um it's not going to pull the franchise out of the out of the doldrums that it was in um, right so they decided to do something uh, a bit more extreme um and have a have a completely new character take take over so like i wasn't aware of um when they offered me the gig i wasn't aware of what the previous plans were for the most part I just they just you know kind of handed me uh, an outline page and a half of notes about okay this is what we see as the as your first three issues and then go do what you want fair enough uh was it Daryl Banks who created the crab mask, by the way, uh, for, uh, for for Kyle? Because uh, that that to me is still one simultaneously the silliest and most iconic mask in, in comics right there. Like, I love it, but I've seen some artists go nuts on it. Like, like sometimes sometimes they're almost horns, <laughs> like with, with how big they can get sometimes. It's, it's, yes. it's really the striking thing. So Daryl created it. Daryl, you know, Daryl came up with a number of costume designs. And we took bits and pieces from each one to do it to create a new one, mm -hmm. um, which is the the costume that that Kyle um, had then and and actually has again now. Um, so the mask was all Daryl, and he was frankly inspired by the mask that Sunfire wears mm -hmm. uh, from the X Men. Mm -hmm. um, he was a big fan of that of of the X Men and of that of that character. So. That was the initial inspiration for what the mask looked like. You know, I never really put two and two together there. Yeah, but it makes but it perfect just sense now. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I love I love how many times they've tried to get him out of that costume, and they're and they're like, oh yeah, no, 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 let's modernize him, let's make him, let's make him new and different. And they always wind up going back to it because it's just such an iconic look. Well, I think um, I think the audience that wants Kyle, and obviously there's an audience for Kyle because the, you know the. Unlike a lot of franchises, you know, the, the Green Lantern that you grew up with is the one that you tend to attach to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Batman, for the most part, is, uh, you know, this guy called Bruce Wayne. Perhaps you've heard of him. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Batman is a specific character. Spider-Man is, is Peter Parker and sometimes Miles Morales, but, you know, that's it. With, with, um, with Green Lantern, there's any... No characters, uh, even just any number of human characters that you can latch on to. Mm -hmm. So I think the you know there's a generation of people who for whom Kyle is their Green Lantern. There's a generation for whom John Stewart is their Green Lantern because that was the Green Lantern they got on on TV right. in, in the animated universe. Um, and then obviously there's a there's a big Hal Jordan um, brigade, both from older readers. And from newer readers, when Hal came back, so um, Green is kind of unique in that sense. In that there's look, there's even Guy Gardner fans. So uh, you know, uh, everybody everybody gets to pick their own flavor. <laughs> it, it, it's it's funny when you say it too, because I remember when that uh, when that Green Lantern movie came out with Ryan Reynolds, and 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 people were like, "Man, I can't believe they white they whitewashed Green Lantern." And I, I was like, "Well, you might you might want to look into that a little bit." <laughs> There's there's a there's a Green Lantern for every single flavor and every single person out there if you look hard enough. One of them's even a dog. <laughs> oh man. Uh, and and I mean Cosmic has kind of always really been your bag in in one way or another, uh whether it be with uh, with DC or or Marvel or what have you and um he, he's not here today but one of our one of our regulars Adam Murdo and I share a love for the character of Genus Bell. Um, and, and I and I knew when you were coming on that I, that I had to mention it because I mean, uh, with a character that's literally called Legacy, you know, or at least when he was introduced, that Legacy heroes are one of my favorite things in comics. It's another thing that that you yourself, uh, you know, steep into in one way or another, whether it be Kyle or or elsewhere. Um, 
uh, tell me a little bit of the process behind uh, the the creation of Genus, and uh, and also what what you yourself feel about legacy characters and 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 their their place in in comics, and you know how they keep the 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 reading audience intrigued and uh, get new ones in the door. Well, I you know obviously legacy characters were much more DC's back. Mm-hmm. Um, Marvel characters were kind of you know always the same person. Yeah. Um, and the and DC characters sort of evolved over over time. Now, obviously, part of that is is due to the golden age uh, characters giving um, yielding to silver age recreations. So, um, you know, Alan Scott yields to Hal, who yields to Kyle. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think it was much more of a DC thing. And obviously, I was very much leaning into that with uh, with Kyle on Green Lantern. Um, and the same era, you know, Wally West was the Flash, um, and I was big. I was actually a big fan of of Mark Wade's Flash run too. With oh yeah, um, particularly with uh, with Michael Laringo. Um, so that the legacy notion seemed to be um, small L legacy notion as we look at the cover <laughs> uh, uh, seemed to be much more of a DC thing, um, but for uh for this for for capital l legacy um marvel was doing out of maybe it was 94 um marvel's annuals that year mm-hmm. were to introduce um a new hero or villain um and they were polybagged with cards of that new hero or villain uh <laughs> Uh, man, the '90s were wild. Was it? Was it? Wasn't that also the series of, of annuals where Adam X the Extreme was introduced? If I remember correctly, I think that might have been. One I, of I, I I think so, but uh, even if even if I knew that, I wouldn't admit it because. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Nicias just just wrote a new a new story with him and over uh, <laughs> over over in the that uh, that X Men. Uh, I think it is actually called X Men Legacy. Now that I think. About oh yeah! It. Oh yeah! Um, well, the. Um, you know, so that I don't know how many annuals we did that year, probably mm. 40. Um, so 40 annuals came out and introduced new characters. Obviously, there was there was great, um, great interest in creating new characters and new IP. Um, and I ended up writing three different annuals that year. Um, so introduced three different characters, um, none of which were Bantam, which was, I think, introduced in the Captain America annual. It was a little guy it was kind of dressed as a chicken and was a boxer and i just thought man somebody somebody should have strangled that idea in the cradle but (laughs) god i haven't thought of bantam in 30 years wow bantam is out there Uh, (laughs) so um so i did i did two other annuals i did the namor annual that year and i did the thor annual that year um and we introduced legacy in the uh, Silver Surfer annual, and the initial idea was that he was going to be called Captain Marvel. You know, mm-hmm. Ron Lim and I um, said, "Well, you know, we and both Ron and I, you know, love uh, the you know the Cree Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel. Um, you know, love the character, love the costume, and we thought, well, we should bring that sort of thing back." And um, so we just wanted to have our new character be called Captain Marvel. Sure. And they ran that up the, up the flagpole to, uh, to Tom DeFalco, actually, who was the editor in chief at the time. And he said, we've already got a Captain Marvel, um, which was Monica Rambeau, um, who I think was appearing in Avengers maybe now and again, but, but very much a, you know, a character that had not appeared in a while in a, in a big big sense and, and we were like well call her something else and then call this dude captain marvel because he's the he's the heir to that legacy and they're like nope we're not doing that we already have a captain marvel so so the irony of the whole thing is we have to end up calling him, call, we end up calling him legacy <laughs> um which is an okay name but it's not as good as captain marvel sure um and so the Monica Rambeau Captain Marvel end up being called Photon. And then a few years later, somebody came up with a great idea to call Legacy Captain Marvel and give him his own series. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's all about timing. All about timing. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's about timing and it's about who's running the joint at the time. Because Oh, think, absolutely. I think by the time um, 
by the time that series came out, um, Tom DeFalco was no longer there. And Tom's a great guy. I, you know, I think Tom did a really nice job when he was editor in chief, and he's he's a terrific, fun writer. And you know, uh, I saw Tom. Uh, I saw Tom at uh, a show in Dallas a few years ago, um, and it was good to catch up with him. But the um, you know, uh, like you said, it's all about timing. Um, it's all about timing and what what the audience seems to want. And and now Legacy's been dead for you know, or Legacy slash Captain Marvel's been dead for ten years, and um, but it will apparently be seen again. That I just I just saw on solicit. So yeah, um, you know, nothing nothing things like nostalgia so uh there's an audience there's an audience out there for whom you know everybody's going oh that guy was cool that that guy with those those, those weird frames on that cosmic powers series <laughs> uh those those weird uh uh patterns for for no apparent reason on the series uh <laughs> my the editor the editor on that book showed show i was in the office and showed me like all of these cool patterns, like that frame all of those covers. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this this is cool. This has never been seen in comics before. We're gonna do these kind of weird patterns. And I was like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> because they're pretty and they go. But woo, 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 woo. But, at, but at that point, it was just like you know, if you could think of a cover cover gimmick that hadn't been done before, mm -hmm. um, you had a pretty good chance of getting that getting that through because it was it was the era where speculators were buying up all that stuff and um and frankly we sold a hell of a lot of copies of cosmic powers <laughs> it, it's funny too uh i mean I, I think about the you know like the, the the covers that had the embossed uh foil card that wasn't an actual card that you know thousands of kids tried to take off of the cut of the cover thinking it was an actual card <laughs> only to then realize they've ruined their cover they, they've ruined like, the comic and there and thereby drove up the value of the ones that weren't destroyed huh? exactly exactly <laughs> you know, it was you know it wasn't an accident that those those cards started getting stuck on covers after marvel had acquired a card company of course <laughs> shock of shocks <laughs> oh boy um, but you know but look look seriously now that stuff we look back at it and everybody's like oh that was cool you know uh i will i suspect we'll start to see some of that again um even more than it is now there's a i think there's some there's some uh there's some fire there for for those kind of uh well let's face it they were you know they were gimmicks so called gimmicks um to to dress covers up and make them kind of cool mm -hmm. um I suspect they'll be back. There's always there's always gimmicks, and I mean, even even today with with DC and Marvel, like you'll see every now and then the uh, the occasional holofoil or the occasional like limited, 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 limited to fifty variant that you know only can be purchased by seven stores in Cleveland. Like it's that it, <laughs> it's that sort of thing. You know, people people are shocked shocked I say, find out that publishers are in this to make money. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> they got to make it somehow um and, and big piggybacking off of the uh the cosmic stuff uh when, when i i mentioned on our uh, on our comic geek speak uh, uh facebook group we were going to have you on uh one of the questions that came in was from uh one of our listeners Corey strode and i figure it piggybacks off this pretty well um he's wondering if it was intimidating at all to step into starlin's shoes on the marvel cosmic stuff Oh, because Jim, you know, was and is one of my best friends. So, um, and he's the one that taught me how to do this and ushered me into Marvel. And so um, it wasn't intimidating. I just wanted to make sure I didn't, you know, like screw up and make him look bad and, you know, have that, have Marvel go, what the hell did you bring us this guy for? <laughs> um, but not, not intimidating in the sense of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm worried that I can't, uh, you know, succeed Jim Starlin. Um, I was just excited to have the opportunity to do it and um, probably too excited to be nervous about it. Just mm -hmm. like too stupid to be nervous about it. Just really wanted to, was excited to have the opportunity and um, you know, what, you're going to let me write Silver Surfer at, you know, like 23 years old or whatever the hell I was. Uh, okay. That sounds good. I can do that. And, and you wrote Silver Surfer for a decent amount of time, uh, for a decent amount of issues. So I yeah, mean, yeah, like five years or so. Yeah, um, yeah, five years, fifty some issues. 
issues uh, and annuals and miniseries and all that kind of stuff. So that was, you know, that was certainly my, you know, on the job training for, for doing this job um, overall was to just, you know, uh, the old, the old, <laughs> Sprawl bounty hunter, <laughs> easily my favorite cover. When I was flipping through the the this you know the old Silver Surfers that that you worked on, uh, this number eighty nine immediately jumped out to me as uh, not only insane but absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, I I think Colleen Durant actually in tears of that one too. Um, nice. So you know, so I worked with Colleen, you know, f- f- almost thirty years ago on that, mm-hmm. and and we're still both doing it. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the surfer, look, the surfer stuff, some of it I look back at and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I, you know, I, I did some cool stuff and some of it, this one, for instance, so I would be like, what was I thinking? Um, but also there's, there's like not infrequently people ask about the captain reptile character that was early <laughs> in my run uh-huh. for some reason. I don't really know why people care about captain reptile. And I, I, you know, I always have to say, Look, that was the editor. The editor was like, Captain Reptile should be in this, you know, in this next set of issues. And I'd be like, why? No one cares. <laughs> but, you know, he just, he had an, he had an affection for that character. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, part of my on the job training of doing the early surfer issues that I did was learning to work within a shared universe and work within the parameters that editorial was giving you. Um, there's give and take, there's collaboration with the editorial staff. You know, you're not, um, it's not your fiefdom and, and you know, these, these toys aren't just yours to play with. So um, I feel like going on to Surfer in the midst of the Infinity Gauntlet story, yeah, um, which is why I went on to Surfer. I mean, Jim left Surfer to go do Infinity Gauntlet and, um, and the Warlock book, the Warlock Monthly that came out. Mm-hmm. which turned into two warlock monthlies um so for me you know like i had to jump right into this huge cosmic crossover and figure out how to tell my stories in and around the infinity gauntlet stuff and um and to me i just felt like oh well that's that's what the job is it's this is just how you do things um and now looking back i realized well that's not really how how a series works when you're you know when it's it, it's under your belt you get to drive it more most times, but in that particular instance, I was, um, you know, I was telling stories between the cracks of other stories, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it was good training for me to to um, to play well with others. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I, I imagine there's got to be some stories that you look back on, you know, with over thirty years, you know, in the biz. And and it's like you're re- you're reading it for the first time. Like I, I, I'm sh- I'm sure there has to be at least a few that you know haven't stuck with you nearly as much as others that are you know like oh yeah I wrote that go figure. <laughs> um, yeah, every once in a while, I'll, like I'll do it. You know, in the in the before times when when you could be in public mm-hmm. uh, and do conventions and signings and stuff like that, um, I would you know somebody once in a while somebody would bring me an issue and I'd go. Do, did I write this? Is this? Does this have my name in it somewhere? Um, uh, for the most part, I you know I I remember them. I certainly don't go back and look at them. I don't I'm like I don't go back and read my stuff when it'll show up. So I kind of feel like oh, I know how it ends. Why would I read that? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, once in a while something something crosses my plate and I go, oh, I that one's completely. Um, you know, mostly 90 stuff. I mean, I was writing so much stuff sure. uh, because it was just, it was a crazy boom time in the business. And uh, for a while, I think I was writing um, a Marvel monthly, a DC monthly, uh, an image monthly and starting on volume like all at the same time, which was, you know, which was possible. And Marvel and DC don't really like to swap the talent around now like they used to. Right. Um, but back then you could sort of, you know, it was not unheard of to do that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so yeah, once in a while, something, something crops up and I go, I don't, you know, the, the embarrassing one is where you go, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't write this. Would you like me to still sign it? And who's ever book it is like actually shows you, yes, in fact, you did write it. <laughs> the credits to so if you were writing, if you're writing up to four titles a month, would you equate that to youth? Could you do that today? You think? 
Um, I could. Yeah. I wouldn't be happy about it, but I could. <laughs> um, four four titles a month um, means that that's what you do every day. I mean, it's still what I do every day, obviously. Mm -hmm. But sure. um, but it's um, when you're doing four titles a month. At least when I was doing four titles, certainly there are, there are writers that can you know crank out four or five or six titles a month. Um, but for for me. Um, four titles a month was was just over the line. Um, that was where, because I and I think when you get into the business and you know you start to pick up credits and you start to, um, you know, maybe be a little bit more popular and you get stuff offered to you, everybody has to find their own line, um, and you you find the line by going over it because you don't know where the line is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I could do four books a month for a while, um, but it, that also meant that I couldn't do anything else. Like if I was doing four monthlies um, and something cool came up, um, whether it be an annual or a one shot for something else, like there was no room for that. Like you couldn't do it. So I, I eventually sort of figured out that my pace comfortably was three issues a month um, so that there was time to do other stuff. Um, and when any series or one shots or something like that came up, you could, you could squeeze it into your schedule and, and, you know, not be in the position of wanting to blow your brains out. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, well, burnouts are, burnouts are a real thing. I mean, no matter what your, your job is, uh, and when it comes to writing, I mean, you know, there's, there's only, there's only so much gas in the tank. Like after a while, you're, you're going to. You're going to run out of words if you, if you try to overdo it too much. Yeah, you do. Look, I, I still think this is bad in the world, um, but you do um, you do need to step away from it. You do need to go do something else um, uh, just to try, sort of recharge the batteries. Um, and certainly, I, I you know I do some teaching now as well. I teach at the Jacob Kruger Studio. Uh, teach comic book writing and do workshops and one on ones and. Um, you know, one of the things that I tell any of the students is that you have to, you know, you have to go live a life too. You can't just, you know, you get real stale just sitting in the same room, staring at the same four walls all the time. Sure. Um, so go, you know, go do things, even if that thing is, you know, taking a drive uh, on a scenic highway or walking in the woods or just, you know, you have to get away from stuff. Um, and I think your, your brain just needs time to recharge. Um, certainly when I'm beating my head against the wall, I can't sort out a plot. Um, like I'll, as soon as we're done, like I'll be, like I'll be doing tonight. Um, how do you just fit together? Um, but the, so the, the, the hardest thing to do is when you're, you know, beating your head against the wall and you can't figure out how the pages fit together. The hardest thing to do is the, the exact thing you need to do, which is put it aside, get up and go do something else. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 just as simple as that maybe it's a good idea to take a break and breathe a little bit and then go back to it <laughs> yeah well like i said when you work at home you're always at work so um so you have to force yourself to to, to not do this right. particularly when you love it like oh, when, sure. you, when you dig this job or any job um it's uh it's that much harder to to get up and walk away from it. And I, and I certainly find that to be true. I don't, um, my, uh, like I know writers who, who treat their comic gigs or whatever it is, like they, you know, they sit down at the desk at nine and take a half an hour for lunch and they get up at five and walk away. Yeah. And that's, that's great for them. That's, that's not the way I'm built. Um, my, you know, if I'm, if I'm in a role, if I'm, uh, or if I'm on a roll, you know, in a groove on a story, you know, I'll still be sitting here at 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been there and done that editing podcasts. So that's uh, sometimes, sometimes you just get to it. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, you just look up and you're like, oh, God, I should have been asleep three hours ago. What How did we get here? Exactly. <laughs> Um, so uh, another another thing that uh, that the listeners, uh, specifically Thomas uh, Thomas Dow's uh, on the super group, uh, wanted me to bring up uh, was your time at CrossGen, um, and I, I know CrossGen certainly had its ups and downs, but when it had its ups, it sure had its ups, uh, and 
to me, in a lot of ways, I feel like today's indie comics market probably wouldn't even really exist without image and cross gen. Like cross gen was was a progenitor of that in a lot of ways, um, and possibly even the you know the the Kickstarter Indiegogo uh, uh, you know crowdsourcing world of it all. Um, may not exist without cross gen in in one way or another, um, and I'd I'd love to get your thoughts on your time there. Um, it doesn't seem like it was twenty years ago, but it was, mm. um, and yeah, I, I regret the experience at all. Um, I I enjoyed the vast majority of it. Uh, obviously, nobody enjoyed the way it ended, um, but I learned more about making comics there than I did anywhere before or since, because it, the comics were the responsibilities of the creative teams. There were no editors. There was, you know, there was a couple of production people who got the books ready for press. Um, but otherwise it was, you ran your own show and um, tended to your own deadlines for the most part and put the book together like you wanted it to be. Um, and if there was something wrong with it or, or um, a mistake crept in, it was your fault. Uh, which was great. I, I loved that part of it. And also loved the fact that um, we had a studio and, you know, everybody went to work there, not nine to five per se, everybody kind of kept their own hours after a while, yeah. but um, you were, you were in the same creative space with your, with your art teams. Um, and that was, that team was great for collaboration. That was um, very much, a situation where you could, um, you know, you could go over to, I could go over to uh, Greg Land or Jim Chung and say, you know, what do you, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to draw next issue? What do you not want to draw? Um, how about we do this thing? Um, and, you know, ultimately everybody had to sit down and do their work. Um, comics are, you know, comics are about ass and shirt. Uh, and so, um, that had to happen every month, but there was also time to um, to kind of talk about things and kick ideas around. And I really liked that part of it. Um, uh, the dogs apparently like that part of it too. Um, <laughs> um, so that um, uh, so that I think the the books became better and had more a sense of creative ownership by the creators, by the creative teams, than you would otherwise. You're sort of in more of an assembly line process. And let me say, I, I owned a store at that time and I was pushing Scion on anyone who came to the door. I love that title. Uh, it was my favorite of, of all the cross-gen titles, uh, Ron. It's when I, I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that because uh, I, I, I was so disappointed when everything folded because I was thoroughly enjoying that series and I got a lot of my customers into it. It was just a fantastic uh, fantasy series. So just my compliments on that is excellent. Um, I, you know, Gundam Head was probably my favorite. Um, I, I loved working with Jim Chung. Um, and I just love this sort of, somebody described it as uh, Prince Valiant meets Star Wars. Which that's I that's was, an excellent description. Which is, I yeah. thought was pretty, which <laughs> yep. I thought was pretty dead on. I think, yep. I think it was maybe Publishers Weekly that described it as Prince Valiant meets Star Wars um in a starred review and we we're like oh yeah that's kind of what we're doing isn't it um yep. so um that was the one that um that really worked for me i mean i love all the books that i did but if i had to pick one if you have to pick your favorite child that's probably cyan just because we had a you know we had a big cast um we were doing you know it, it was sort of a fully realized fantasy yep. world um and um working with Jim was great. Uh, he was just a, was and is a tremendous talent and put uh, blood, sweat and tears into every page. Um, so I, you know, I, I like that. I liked the path a lot. I like Sojourn a lot. Uh, uh, and, and the other stuff that I did there too, but um, you know, it was, the books were ours for the most part, you know, the boss would come in and look over your shoulder a bit and, and kibitz, but to great extent, you were left to, you were left alone to do the book that you wanted to do, um, as long as it had kind of a tie into the overall cross-gen universe, which I generally tried to ignore as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons why the book was so good. I, I love, I mean, I, I'm, I'm ignorant now. Who owned 
own Scion, like the copyright to it and all that. Same people that own everything, Disney. Okay. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Disney came in and at the end when the, you know, when everything was kind of swirling around the drain, uh, Disney came in and bought everything for a million bucks, uh, bought all wow. the properties. Wow. And it was mostly to get a hold of one property that they wanted, which was a bad as ad, which was a okay. uh, creator participation series that we did in the um in sort of the offshoot line of of books that had nothing to do with uh the cross gen universe mm -hmm. um that was by jam dematis yep yep um mike plug um jm who you know lives like an hour south of me in my in my old hometown uh so um and mike plug who is a genius so oh, um plug. just a you know just a tremendous uh a tremendous the the I think the pitch actually came in from Demetis um, without an artist attached, uh, and I remember reading the pitch and went, "Well, this is great. We got to do this. This is just really a great book." And the uh, Mark Alessi, the boss, read the pitch as well, and he said, "You know, you know who would be great to draw this? Mike Plug." And I was like, "Yeah, Mike Plug would be great to draw anything." Uh, <laughs> But you're not going to get him. Like he's, you know, he's he lives in London and he does movie design and he doesn't need to do comics. Um, but unless he's trying to reference, to great extent was like 70, 70s and 80s Marvel comics. So he had great affection for Mike Plug. And he said, You get me Mike Plug's number, I'll get him to do the series. So I was like, all right. And I put my feelers out for for who would actually um, be able to connect me to Mike Plug. I got the number and gave it to Alessi and he came into my office like 20 minutes later and said, yeah, he's drawn the book. And I thought to myself, man, you must have offered him a lot. <laughs> um, but obviously, but obviously he was worth it. Um, it's just, sure. a, it's a tremendous looking book. And, oh yeah. Um, the color by Nick Bell, who I think is out of comics actually was, was a huge factor in it as well. Mm -hmm. So Disney bought cross gen to get a bad as ad. Wow. And to a lesser extent, to get get its hands on Meridian, mm -hmm. um, because they saw you know like animated film. Yeah, Meridian right has there. a Disney feel to it. Yep. Oh, yeah. um, and the rest of it was just kind of yeah, whatever. Um, and and ultimately, Disney put out. They're actually up on my shelf up there. Um, put out a handful of little jewel books, like that cannibalized the Abadazad material. Yes. Um, into sort of prose slash comics hybrids. Um, and they didn't really sell. Um, they they kind of went out into the market and and just sat there. You could, <clears throat> when there was you know when Borders Books was still a thing, you could you know you could find a copy of an Abadazad hardcover for two bucks in the in the um, and, and I did, and I ended up buying as many as I could because I just couldn't stand the thought of leaving them there. Sure. Um, so Abadazad just kind of never went anywhere. Um, uh, and the rest of the stuff just sat. Marvel, I don't know if you guys know this, but Disney owns Marvel. What? <laughs> shockingly, Disney, shockingly. I um, think Disney owns me and I just haven't found out yet. <laughs> um, it's all right, you've probably, you've probably been microchipped already. All right, yeah, I figured. I hear that's going on, so. <laughs> I, hear that's, I hear that's going on, I read it on my phone. Yeah. The government yeah. wants to keep track of me, I read it on my phone. <laughs> With your 5G signal, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so you know, Marvel did a few sort of reboots of some of the, uh, the cross-gen stuff. They did um, Ruse, which was pretty true to what it was, uh, Sigil right. and Mystic, which were very different takes on the concepts. Um, so I think they ended up being sort of, you know, they weren't the thing that the old cross-gen fans wanted, and they weren't something that new fans wanted because they thought, oh, it's crush I don't want that so it ended up being kind of neither fish nor fowl and um and everything just kind of disappeared so um you know in this in this uh you know in this crowdfunding world that we live in now I think there's uh, I think there's probably some uh you could you could sell a few copies of a cross-gen omnibus of you know various series oh yeah because uh, all that stuff's obviously out of print in 50 cent bins now but there was some pretty good material. It sure and, was. Um, uh, but I don't. I don't know that anybody at Disney even knows they own it anymore because 
Um, I'm not being facetious. I mean, it's I just like there's no like any time that, that something like that comes back into the zeitgeist, it's because somebody was attached to it and right. believed in it and and um, agitated for it. There's somebody um, somebody was went to bat for it. And I don't know that um, there's anybody within the structure there that really uh, has an affection for it or knows about it. So um, it's all just kind of sitting there um, uh, a number of years ago there was uh marvel contact me contacted me about um doing uh a cross-gen mini series uh that would have pulled all of the cross-gen worlds together on one planet um and told a story during the secret wars storyline oh wow hmm. but um but it got it got to the point where i had to draw a map of what that world would look like that was one of the that was one of the aspects of the pitch that was requested. Well, what, how does this all fit together? I'm like, I don't know. Ask somebody to draw. Like, well, you draw it. Um, so there's a map and a pitch somewhere um, for how all of this was going to um, how all of this was going to shake out. Um, but uh, then there was an editorial change, and um, it just kind of died on the vine and never got done. Mm. Damn, because that that, that would have been. That would have been a heck of a Secret Wars mini. I'll tell you that much. I'll say, yeah, yeah, because it would have been completely out of left field from everything else that was being done in Secret Wars. But it also makes perfect sense if all the universes are colliding, crisis style. Like, you know, that would have been a good way to bring to bring them all together. Yeah, I think it, it would have made it would have made sense yeah. uh, in the context. And um, as I recall, I think they were talking about Butch Guys drawing it. So, um, so that would have been awesome. And yep. I, I always. You know, I've worked with Butch a few times, uh, including, you know, obviously being in the cross-gen studio with him. Um, so that would have been tremendous. But, you know, the, the history of comics is littered with things that seem to be good ideas for a while and then just never come to fruition. Unfortunately, the case, unfortunately, the case. Yeah. And, and I mean, especially, you know, you mentioning, and I mean, I kind of mentioned it as well, but like in, in this crowd source world, cross-gen just feels like it's made for it um and you know again it happened 20 years ago if it happened now i i really would be curious to see where it would go um but you know you can't you can't do time travel that way you can't just make it suddenly happen 20 years after because what what happens now wouldn't happen without it so it's 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 a wonderful piece of history that i'm glad is still still accessible in, in one way or another uh, whether it be on you know Marvel's catalog or or you know other ways of getting a hold of it, right? Well, we you know we the survive the you know cross gen survivors. Um, most of us, I think, felt like it was just um, it was just too soon. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a few years before Hollywood discovered comics, before um, before LA discovered that San Diego existed a few hundred, you know, uh, you know, like a hundred miles down the, down the road. Yep. Um, and was a, a huge marketing opportunity. So we, you know, I, there's part of me that feels like if crossing had come along five years later, it would probably still be, it would probably still be going because, um, it, it's a, it's a ready-made packaged universe, um, that a Netflix or Amazon or Hulu could come in and, and, scoop up all at once and have a you know have an immediate uh r d factory to to do you know the kind of genre comics that we were doing but also just whatever kind of comics um so in a lot of ways it was just you know it didn't survive long enough to be to ride that wave that was coming sometimes it's just how it rolls <laughs> well, speaking of genre I, I mentioned before we started recording how deeply i admire uh, samurai heaven and earth um, I, I've, uh, my wife is Japanese and I, I've been to Japan several times and I, I'm a history teacher. So I've studied the Japanese feudal period quite a bit. Let me tell you, man, that book, I mean, I've read so many books re re related to history topics in comics throughout my life and rarely do many of them achieve what that book achieved in terms of the, the attention to the detail, the authenticity, and just the, some of the most stunning artwork I've ever seen. Uh, in, in a comic dealing with, with that type of subject matter. I mean, what you and, and uh, Luke Ross did, uh, my hat's off. It's, it's a book I still return to periodically and read them 
plus the, the great swashbuckling element to them, the, 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 the adventure and the travel. Uh, it's just, it's a stunning achievement. It's when I, I was so excited to tell you how much I just love that concept and the, those stories. Oh, thanks, so, Chris. I, it's, yeah. it's honestly probably my favorite thing. Um, it's, oh, <laughs> it's, it's tough to it's tough to pick between your children right but yeah. um that's my favorite child uh probably uh if i had to give one answer that's the, you know that's the one that just like every page is exactly what we wanted it to be um uh, that 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 makes sense because just when i got it i remember when i first again i had i had my store at the time and the issue first came and i was like oh a samurai comic let me order some and see what it's like and I, i'm telling my customers you gotta read this like this is amazing like look at this it's like those opening paper you had like the battle and the castle and the armor everything was i mean you must have researched your, your ass off for that book um i well i researched enough that it looked like i knew what i was doing <laughs> <laughs> which is Fair kind enough. of the goal um <laughs> I don't really have to know. Luke has to know. Like, well, he certainly, he certainly did. Like, My God, I can, I can make shit up, but then he's got to put it on the page. Yeah. So, um, so um, honestly, cross gen samurai Earth probably wouldn't exist without cross gen uh, because uh, the first time I really wrote samurai stuff to any real extent was the path at cross gen. Mm. Uh, which was a book I was not slated to write, but I went into the boss's office and talked my way into writing it. Cause I was like, you know, that's stuff that I love. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to, to play in that world, even though the path was not um, feudal Japan, it was, um, you know, all the cross-gen books took place on planet Mirth, as mm -hmm. far as we were concerned. It was, everything was kind of like Earth, but just enough that it wasn't really Earth. So we called everything Mirth. So the path was feudal Japan on Mirth. Um, and when cross Gen fell apart, you know, and I had done like two years of, of the path, I was not at all, um, I was not at all sated. I wanted to do more samurai stuff. And, and frankly, I had used, um, I had used the cross Gen budget to buy like a shelf full of samurai books. Um, so I had, I had all the material handy. Uh, so, um, and I had I had met Luke Ross um, at CrossGen. He came up from Brazil uh, to work in the office for I don't know three months or something like that because he was you know he was kind of a, a pinch hit artist for us. And then um, we just loved what he was doing so much. We decided to um, have him come you know like work in the studio for three months or however long his visa was was available for. Him. So that's where I met Luke. We got to be buddies. Um, and then once he went back to Brazil, uh, was working on other cross-gen stuff, um, when that dried up, um, I got Luke onto my Green Lantern uh, sort of end cap run on the, the third volume, which uh, where they brought me back to kind of finish up Kyle's story. And I knew Luke needed, needed work at that point. So he got, um, he got that gig um from us having worked together at cross gen and then when we were done with that um or while we were doing that i showed luke a like a handful of concepts like you know which which one of which one of these might you be interested in drawing and he picked samurai um which i was really happy because that was the one i really wanted to do um and we um uh you know we we did the deal at um uh, we did the deal at Dark Horse, and Luke just obviously drew those off it. It's you know, what it, a number of the uh, pages and covers hang on the wall that I'm facing right now. I, I can Im imagine. I mean, both both series. Uh, just I remember when I first read it, and I, I remember correctly, it opens with with this the the, the castles being besieged, um, and just the the, it, the art is. I mean, I've been reading comics my whole life. That's the most breathtaking art I've ever seen. In the book and, and like like the lovemaking scenes in those two stories are amazing i mean the the i don't mean that like in a in a like a tawdry way like it, it's it's just it's breathtaking stunning artwork um uh, I'm, I'm envious of the pages you have <laughs> um uh, you, you should be frankly yeah uh, <laughs> uh, um yeah i mean we we when you find a guy that you click with you know guy or or girl that you click with as an artist. I mean, you just want to keep working with them. Um, and Luke was up for like 
I always had complete confidence in anything that I could come up with. I knew Luke was going to, was going to draw like that, you know, that 12 panel grid um, that we're looking at right now. Like I knew Luke was going to be able to do that and he was going to carry it, you know, carry it forward. Um, so I, we did a number of things in the book that I probably wouldn't have given to other artists. There's a, uh, there's a big fight scene in China where he's uh, Shiro, the the main character, is taking on a huge uh, warrior, and it's just like a scatter of panels across a double spread. Um, just tremendous stuff. It's it's all like side of the pencil, beautiful stuff. Um, and it took Luke probably twice as long to draw these pages as. Um, as his other stuff, because it was, you know, we knew that we were going to go from his pencils to uh, right to color. And the colorist on the first volume is actually Jason Keith, who was also a cross um, and now does most of his work for Marvel. Uh, so, um, yeah, the two volumes of Samurai Heaven and Earth are probably my two favorite things. Um, we actually just got the rights back from Dark Horse earlier this year. Oh, oh wow. wow. Our, our deal... Um, our deal was up because it was it was essentially out of print. There were a handful of copies of volume two left. Um, and so we worked out a deal to um, have the rights back. So we so we own it free and clear um, and can do anything we want with it in this crowdfunding sort of world, he said. Ah. Hmm. OK. And if I think this in this second volume, um, there, there were covers for a, there were five covers completed for a third volume of the series, which, um, which was to take place in the Caribbean. Um, wow. The story would move from, the story went from, uh, Japan to China, to France, uh, then to the Middle East to, in, in and the, you know, the pyramids of Egypt. And then the third volume was going to go to the Caribbean. Uh, where uh, a number of literary and historical pirates would be uh. involved. <laughs> um, and the first issue is actually written. The first, the first issue of volume three has been written for quite a while. Uh, so Luke and I have been in touch recently uh, to figure out how we're going to make that happen. My wallet is ready and poised for whenever that appears. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm 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 happy. I'm always happy to hear uh, a book has gone back to to the creators, and that and that there's a chance for more. So that's that that just made me very happy. <laughs> and happy well, I mean, the, the plan was always to do um, volume three of Dark Horse, um, but there were a number of editorial changes at Dark Horse. Um, Luke was tied up um, for years at Marvel uh, on an exclusive contract, mm -hmm. uh, doing Star Wars stuff, which he's still doing now. Yep. Um, because he's really good at Star Wars. Uh, uh, so um, it was a matter of, it was never a matter of, well, we don't really feel like doing this. It was just a matter of Timing. when can we figure out the time to do this? Right. So um, so now we're getting serious about figuring out the, you know, the, the when and the how and all that. And, and part of, you know, part of that equation certainly is you have to consider, you know, when you have, I don't know, we probably got 250 or 260 pages of material um, that's ours now, um, free and clear, uh, from the first two volumes. Uh, you, part of that equation is, well, what to do with that? So, you know, what we have, we have a big, fat, hardcover book if we want to make it. Do we want to make it? Mm -hmm. uh, I love that on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I know one person who definitely wants you to make it. <laughs> Well, perhaps some, so, so far. yeah so per, perhaps some multimedia opportunities you never know these days yeah I, I myself i myself haven't 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 read it but i am certainly intrigued looking at these pages and uh if it does happen to go back in print then i know where i can go <laughs> so two copies now yeah um well it's it's a sort of thing that certainly has made the rounds um to studios out there yeah. mm -hmm. um but it's also you know, a 16th or 17th century historical epic that takes place in Japan and China and, uh, you know, Louis XIV's France. And so, you know, not cheap. Like it's, 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 it's not exactly my dinner with Andre in terms of budget. So, <laughs> um, so that's a much bigger ask 
but obviously they're you know since luke and i did this mm -hmm. um the the availability of um streaming services and like we live in a much different world now oh absolutely um, and sure. all you have to do is find you know find the place that goes you know a samurai meets the three musketeers we'll do that for 180 million dollars yeah i mean the story totally lends itself to that kind of presentation plus forgive me uh, ron what was the name of the character who becomes his traveling companion the uh the merchant um the slave trader um um uh he is a uh, spaniard um, that's right okay uh, mostly we, we refer to him as the uh the spaniard because he's got it we gave him a long ass spanish name right you know I, I only brought him up because he's a great character and i thought what was great great about the series that you brought these two figures who are from totally different worlds and cultures and they sort of found this chemistry and this bond as they went through these uh adventures together it just it just made the book even that much more thoroughly enjoyable it was it was one of those books that sort of wrote itself for whatever reason it's sometimes sometimes stories are just there to be plucked off the tree and you just have to uh let them you know you just have to open the door and let them in um there, i remember very distinctly because i think I, I still wrote it uh when we were still in florida um and the, there's a sequence with a blind beggar in i think the second issue of the first volume um and it's one of my favorite sequences that i've ever written um uh because the blind beggar uh, asks the samurai for for um, uh, for money, and then there's you know like crazy violence happens, but the, yep. obviously the blind beggar can't see it. Like that whole sequence was not intended to be in the book, but I happened to be out for a drive, and I remember the road that I was on, uh, the sort of Florida back road um, that I was on at the time, and that whole sequence just like appeared in my mind unbidden and i had to actually pull over into a parking lot uh for a state park i think and write down the whole sequence because it just sort of was there uh, ian you got to read this man i i need to yes. <laughs> the more i hear about it the more i have to read it definitely um i want to i want to go a little a, a little more modern uh as we as we get closer to your your main purpose for being on this episode um swamp gob was brought up uh, on uh, on the super group uh by one of our uh, listeners robert crash sheridan uh he was asking about uh, when the last four issues would be solicited uh, i but i do see issue three solicited in this month's previews uh the august previews so i believe that uh, uh i assume that four five and six are are to come after that uh but uh you want to tell sure, us that that sounds about? likely yeah sure why not <laughs> um, well the, the way that series is actually working is it the the individual chapters are appearing in heavy metal magazine got it um, okay so um so what uh so what heavy metal does is they serialize the chapters um in the magazine and then repackage um the chapters depending on the length mm -hmm. um into individual issues that have bonus material and sketches and all sorts of stuff like that in it so you can you can get it in the magazine or you can get it and in, in the individual issues um and uh i'm really happy with the way it's turned out uh it uh, uh it's a this is an idea and the, the the short version is um union an all black uh contingent of uh, union soldiers in the civil war ends up meeting a um contingent of confederate soldiers uh in louisiana towards the end of the civil war um as you might expect they do not get along <laughs> um, and uh and the confederate soldiers end up summoning up a swamp demon uh by going to a swamp witch that lives deep in the bayou um and obviously things get completely out of control from there and the confederates and the union soldiers are sort of thrown together as do you want to work together and maybe survive or do you want to try to kill each other while this thing is out there okay um, civil war and horror i gotta read this too man oh, oh, um, and the artist on it is uh an italian guy because obviously when you want authentic u.s civil war depictions <laughs> <laughs> you go to an italian artist um 
Uh, the Italian artist is named Paolo Armitano, mm -hmm. whose stuff I had never heard of. Uh, um, heavy Metal brought him to me and said, how about this guy? And I was like, oh my God, where did you find him? He's awesome. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm hugely thrilled working with him uh, on the book. Uh, I actually write, write, uh, write another chapter tonight. Uh, nice. And uh, so all told, the book will probably, the, the, the whole story will probably be about 120 pages. Very cool. And, 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 uh, and we were this, talking about borders earlier, by the way, I just I just got to say, I love I love the green border on the uh, mm -hmm. on the on the swap. God, uh, heavy metal presents the, the elements, you know, trade here. Yeah, and, that's how heavy metal came up with that um, with that for all of their uh, elements releases mm -hmm. and sent me, you know, sent me basically here's what yours looks like. And I said, oh, really? This is cool. cool. <laughs> um, uh, although I have I haven't actually gotten my comps on this, so I don't know what the actual book looks like. So, um, but uh, yeah, I couldn't. You know, it's an idea that has been. I've probably had the idea for twenty years, and it just um, it just uh, never found the right spot. Um, and off like a lot of the stuff that I want to do is historical because that's you know I have a huge interest in history, and I think that um, a lot of the more interesting stories are set in different eras. Take me somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you know, I can I can see the world that's outside my window by looking out my window. I want to go to the Civil War or to to Versailles in the 17th century or something like that. But but honestly, a lot of publishers are reticent to do period material because they know that it's a much tougher sell uh, pitching it to Hollywood because that means more of a budget. Sure. Uh, so I've, I, you know, Swamp God had made the rounds a few times to different publishers and, and uh, nobody bid on it. And, uh, and when Heavy Metal came knock and Tim Seeley is actually, he's the editor um, on, uh, besides being a, an artist and a writer, uh, Tim is uh, my editor at Heavy Metal. Um, and Tim came knock and said, hey, you know, you got any, got any ideas? You got some stuff you want to do because new people are taking over at heavy metal and they they're looking for stuff mm -hmm. so i sent them uh i think i sent them three different ideas and they took two of them, um swamp god and another one called world traveler that'll be out either late this year or early next year um and you know i was like you know a civil war story is a little harder to uh a little harder to um you know to budget you know, to, to make as a, as a, you know, in other media, and they're like, yeah, we don't care. We just want to do comics. Um, uh, and, the, and, you know, and the, and the odd thing is now, you know, Abby Metal tells us to the grapevine that they've, they've got, you know, they've got studio interest in, in Swamp God because it's a, it's a contained story. You could, you know, you could get together 15 actors and go out into the swamp and film this because it's, it's, it's fairly, contained it's it's kind of um it's finite so uh mm -hmm. see what happens sounds good to me and uh and yeah i mean i'm i'm, I'm happy to see that uh i i always kind of love it when there's two different ways to consume media like whether whether it be you know in chapters or whether it be fully collected uh i know that uh, dc has been doing that a little bit uh online where they'll <clears throat> you know they'll have the individual chapters on on dc uh infinite uh, or on Comicsology, and then they'll go ahead and collect it as a full issue after the fact. Um, it, it's a it, it's a cool concept, and it's a cool way to get to get things a little bit more piecemeal if you're really in the mood for it. Well, it's really you know I think the the publishing of comics has evolved into um, you know basically for for so long it was just newsstand, mm -hmm. and then for a pretty decent chunk of time it was just the direct market, and then direct market sort of started to reach into actual other outlets like Barnes and Noble and Walmart for collections and things like that. Um, and then we got digital. And so now um, we release stuff in as many different packages as possible. Um, single issues in the direct market, um, collect editions in the direct market into big box stores and through uh, online retailers that might be named after a river in Brazil. Um, <laughs> you know, digital, you know, digital distribution. Um, in some ways, that's what, that's the direction that CrossGen was leaning um, 
years ago um, and another, you know, sort of before it's time kind of thing because CrossGen did single issues. We did collected material um, for paperbacks. We did uh, comics on the, what we, what we called comics on the web, which were, you know, kind of one of the first online uh, portals to, to read comics. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, um, we did anthology books called uh, Edge and Forge, which uh, you can find those in a dollar bin too, um, which collected, you know, a lot of single issues in a small sort of handheld package for like eight bucks. So um, the, the concept there was very much um, make it once, sell it in as many different packages as you can. And I think that's, to great extent where we are as a publisher as, as an industry now mm -hmm. um and i'm you know look i'll 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 buy issues of hellboy as they come out in singles and then i'll buy the trade paperback and <laughs> then i'll buy the library edition yep. um so um uh you know the 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 readership has grown um it's gotten a lot of, uh through you know thank god we're not just selling comics to like 14 year old boys um there's there's a lot of different comics for a lot of different people sure. so naturally the business has to evolve so that you're delivering those comics in as many different places and packages as you can well and and speaking of of different types of comics for for you know everybody uh you also have uh, a comic that we mentioned on our last previews episode coming out of, of aftershock called almost american which couldn't be more different than anything that we've talked about so far. Um, and uh, I, I love spies. I especially love like Russian spies are kind of the thing right now. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd love to know more about the book and and just how much you've been obsessed with the idea of, of Russian spies over the years or whether this is just something that just came, came to you now. Well, now there's a Russian spy who calls me on a regular basis. So, oh, okay. Uh, so I have to. You have to be obsessed with it. Um, nice. So, almost American is a is a is a book that came to me through Aftershock. Um, Mike Martz at Aftershock is the editor in chief, um, mm -hmm. and he's a guy that I've known for for, for years, back into the '90s for, for, at Wizard Magazine, um, and then then at DC, and then at Marvel, and, um, and Mike called me and said hey we've got this we've got this real life story of two russian intelligence operatives who ended up fleeing russia and coming to live in the united states uh and we think um we think this is gonna make a cool comic um could would you consider like adapting it mm -hmm. and and in some ways it's you know my first real job like even while i was in college was as a journalist um, I worked at a daily newspaper as a sports reporter and then as an entertainment writer and editor. Um, so like journalist is the first real job that I ever had. Um, comic book writer is kind of the second real job that I've ever had. Um, so, so my job here was to, was to collate all that stuff, articles and a book proposal and all of this material that told that story um, and speaking to um, to Jan Newman, who is the, the Russian intelligence operative, whose story I'm telling, um, talking to him on the phone a lot and getting anecdotes and insight into what this was all like for him and then put it all together in this series. Um, so, um, so first issue was out in uh, September. Uh, Marco Castiello is the artist. Um, again, with the Italian artists, um, there's... <laughs> There's something in the water and or pasta over there where they just, ah. it's actually, there's, there's such an amazing tradition of, of uh, comic art in Italy that just so many amazing artists come out of there. So, um, so Marco Castiello is drawing it um, and uh, uh, Flavio um, Dispenza is our colorist doing really nice work. And then the letterer is Russ Wooten, who is a, has lettered and designed comics for years. Oh yeah. The cover is also by Russ. So the oh, cover, wow. the, oh, this fantastic. is Russ's design. Um, and he's doing the uh, he's doing the covers for the whole series. So they're very sort of 
graphic, almost um, propaganda poster-like. Uh, so this is, what I'm telling here is a real story. So it's a five issue, nice. uh, it's gonna be a five issue series that is a real story. And, um, and now I'm sort of buddies with Jan and we talk all the time and we're actually started on like two other comic projects or another comic project that's uh, called Valhalla that we're doing as an OGN um, that uh, we have not uh, we have not taken out to publishers yet. Uh, that's being drawn by Jason Masters, who um, drew the Warren Ellis uh, James Bond stuff for oh, cool. Dynamite, oh, as wonderful. well as Captain America. Um, and then uh, we're talking about doing a uh, a line of uh, spy comics with the International Spy Museum in Washington D.C. Oh, man. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, your life takes odd turns where like, oh yeah, well, he's with a guy who was like, who, who worked for the FSB for most of his life and then had to flee when, when they delivered to him a pistol with one bullet in it. Whew. So that's a thing that's in the book. That is a thing. That's, that's you know, that's, that's a, it's time to go notification. To say the least. <laughs> To say the least. Oh boy. Well, well what are the issue? I can't wait to read it. Ugh. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and yeah, that was, that was in last month's previews and, uh, there'll be more to come. And then obviously eventually a collection once it's, once it's all said and done. But, uh, as you said, it's in, in shop September 1st. So, uh, so go to your local comic shop and you'll be able to purchase it there, uh, for sure. Um, but now it's time for our main feature. Uh, our main presentation, as it were, uh, and, and what got us here in the first place, uh, as uh, when this episode comes out, uh, which will probably be the day after we're recording it, uh, more than likely be the case, since uh, that's going to be nice and easy for everybody involved. Uh, we're going to have five days left on this campaign for a book called Resolution with yourself, Andy Lanning, and Rick frickin' Leonardi. Like... Oh, I, I, I can't even I can't even describe how happy that creative team makes me. Um, and it's, you know, very much in your wheelhouse of, of cosmic. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was thrilled to hear about it when I did. And I'm happy to promote it here on the show and hope that we can get it past that goal point so that it does indeed happen because I mean, talk about a creative team and I, I love the concept as well. So uh, tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, this is, um, well, what it, what it really is, is, you know, calling up your buddies and saying, hey, let's do a comic. Yep. Um, so uh, thankfully I have very talented friends and Andy Landing and Rick Leonardi uh, whose coattails I am happy to ride. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is on the Zoop platform, which is a crowdfunding platform, you know, just like uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but Zoop is a new platform and it is comics centric. Uh, so the guys from Zoop got in touch with me a while ago and said, hey, we're, you know, this is, this is our next venture. We wanna, we wanna get a new platform up and running. Um, and part of their deal is that they sort of handle the campaign for you um, they handle the logistics and put you with a printer and with a fulfillment house and like all of the all the extra work that goes with a Kickstarter. Um, they sort of offer concierge service to take that off of your plate if you so desire. Um, so that sounded good to us. So we could concentrate on creating the book, which is this. Um, it's an it's an uh, the the initial idea came from Andy. Um, who is co-writing with me. Uh, and Andy is also um, inking Rick on it. So uh, Andy is the dual threat in the whole in the whole mix. He's he's writing and inking. And he and Rick are a tremendous combination. They oh, worked yeah. here a few times before. Um, in fact, I think that um, uh, Andy inked Rick on a Nightwing sequence that I think is in the most recent issue of Nightwing. Nice. Uh, flashback sequence, um, plus some other stuff that they've done together. Um, so it just seemed like the right fit for, um, for uh, us to pull together. Um, Andrew Dollhouse is the colorist. And it's, uh, it's kind of Andy and I going back to our, our cosmic wheelhouse. Um, obviously me with 
Green Lantern and Silver Surfer, Star Wars, uh, and Andy having written Guardians of the Galaxy and Nova and Legion of Superheroes. This is, you know, this is the kind of material that we're not unfamiliar with. Um, so the, the story itself is about, um, you know, it's a cosmic story, the far-flung reaches of space, and uh, there is a, an intergalactic peacekeeping force known as the Resolute. Uh, and the greatest hero of the Resolute uh, is a woman named Zan Maddox, who is now retired from service um, and lives uh, kind of a reclusive life on a remote planet. Um, and uh, the story is really about what happens when people from her past come and find her and say, uh, the villain that was your arch nemesis uh, has been found. Um, he is failing and he is right to be taken and there's a bounty on his head. Hmm. So we can go get him. Um, and Zan Maddox has to decide whether she's gonna saddle up one more time and do this, or if she just wants to be left alone. Uh, so that decision uh, on her part is what sort of spurs the story and um, uh, hopefully spurs a, a number of volumes because we've got a bigger story that we want to tell here. Um, but this, this initial volume um, is going to be uh, 80 pages. It's an oversized sort of French style album. Beautiful. Um, that's a pinup, uh, that's pinup piece by uh, an artist named Greg Broadmore, who mm -hmm. is uh, with uh, Weta Workshop in New Zealand and is a buddy of ours. Um, so the, um, the, what's on the campaign is the, the hardcover graphic novel. Um, there's a companion book that will be, uh, that will have the script and Rick's layouts, Rick's sketches, designs. Um, and then there is a conveniently enough, a special edition portfolio, kind of like the, um, the, it's a throwback to kind of the Marvel and DC portfolios of the 80s. Oh, yeah. Um, where we basically uh, leaned on a bunch of our friends to produce pieces. Uh, and uh, that's the list. Um, oh, we didn't do too bad. Um, it, 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 it's good. To, it's good to have friends in high places. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think the, you know, I think there's a package that has the portfolio, the companion book and the oversized hardcover. Um, so you can get all three mm -hmm. or you can do them individually. Um, and there's also original art rewards. Um, you can buy the, you can buy the cover uh, original art, which in this case is uh, you get both Rick's pencils and Andy's inks because Andy inked it uh, into digital scan because they're on opposite sides of the Atlantic. Um, so you actually get both pieces. Uh, uh, there's a there's a double spread. There's other art rewards. Um, so it's sort of full service from everything from a, the digital edition of the comic to, um, you know, the uh, the actual original artwork, which yep. looks something faintly like that. It, I, I cannot even say how excited oh. I am about this. This I mean, it, it, it. I love cosmic to begin with, um, and this just feels like simultaneously such a throwback to when I was younger, and also something new and unique. Um, and that's that's what I look for in, in my in my current comics. You know, something that like reminds me of old, but is also completely new. And that is, that is definitely what's going on here. Well, it's um, uh, our short version. Our elevator pitch is. Unforgiven meets uh, Green Lantern Corps. Hmm. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> that, that's enough. That's enough for me. My God. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, with, with how hard is it to 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 ground stories uh, that that are cosmic like like this as well, um, you know, stories that uh, that are that are already in space. Like obviously, you need to make them feel you know down to earth and relatable at the same time. Um, is there a is there like a, a meeting of on on both ends of that to try to combine it, or does it just sort of happen naturally? Not really. I mean, I I to me, they're all stories are character driven. Mm -hmm. um, whether your character is, um, you know, 
a, a kid who you know inherits a magic ring in an alley or a uh, alien covered in tinfoil on a surfboard um, or a samurai in the 17th century. It's all character driven. Um, and if and the job is to make your audience care about what happens to the characters. Right. Um, and the, to me, um, everything else is window dressing, you know, whether the, the story is about, um, you know, uh, the, the return of a cosmic villain being hunted down for his bounty or, you know, an intimate character piece. Um, it, it all comes from the same place. I think if you, if you get your audience to care about the characters, everything else kind of takes care of itself. Um, I feel like the, the, the reality and the, and the um, believability of the characters uh, has to ground everything. And then the audience accepts whatever else comes. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Um, and uh, again, as this is released, uh, there'll be about five more days left on the campaign uh, and uh, under 3,000 more needed in order for it to go forward here. Um, Zoop itself looks like a pretty cool platform, to be entirely honest with you. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, I, just looking at the stuff that's, uh, that's on here now, um, it's nice to have a platform that's, you know, just comics. Um, and, yeah, that was that was certainly one of the attractions when they reached out to me was that, oh, it's it's, you know, um, and I think, look, Kickstarter is great. Indiegogo is great. Yeah. Um, but they are um, they are expansive. They are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that you can buy, you know, you can buy whatever you want on Kickstarter. Uh, you can support whatever you want. And certainly I've you know supported a bunch of campaigns. Um, on Kickstarter, on Zoop now. I, I just pledged to my buddy Bart Sears' campaign uh, last night before it uh, uh, before it wrapped up uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's it's nice to have a platform that is really comic centric, mm -hmm. and if and it's it's a place to go even if you don't know what you're looking for, um, because if you if you if you're a comics person, you can go there and go shopping basically. That's what we like to do. There, 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 I think there's shops for that uh, last I checked, but yeah. <laughs> uh, good stuff, good stuff. All right, before we wrap up, um, I've got two more questions in the queue here from the super group. One, one a little bit serious and one, and one a little bit silly. I'll, I'll go serious first and we'll end on silly. Uh, and, and then I'll have you, you know, plug your wares one last time here so we can make sure everybody finds everything where they're supposed to be found. Um, Scott Hollows on the supergroup uh, asked a question uh, about uh, one of the more infamous uh, moments in in Green Lantern history. Um, you know the the women in refrigerators moment, um, and and just asked ask the question of uh, you know hindsight is twenty twenty, and and how you feel about it looking back at, back on it today. Uh, that if you were writing it over again today, uh, would you do anything differently? Or, or uh, you know, is it really hard to say, uh, you know, this many years after the fact? It's a, it's, well, it's hypothetical and I don't really engage in those because it is what I, it is what it is. And I did yeah. what I did. Exactly. Um, and um, you can't change it. Uh, so to me wondering, you know, would I do that now? probably a waste of time um would i do that now in exactly the same way no i don't think i would sure. um, um but you know certainly on the one hand it was you know um it was intended to be shocking and disturbing um right. guess mission accomplished there <laughs> um uh, and on the you know um on the other hand i'm glad that it started a conversation about that particular trope mm -hmm even though that particular trope is not one that I was even thinking of no. when I wrote it. Right. Um, uh, the, the obvious comparison is um, the Gwen Stacy moment. Sure. Um, Green Goblin tossing her off. Uh, uh, yes, it was supposed to be George Washington Bridge. supposed to be, yep. Yeah, we, 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 we literally had a 15 minute con long conversation about this when we talked about that issue here on the, here on the show. It, as, it, as somebody who's it, driven across the George Washington Bridge a lot of times. Oh yeah. The George Washington Bridge. I, 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 I literally <laughs> live by the George Washington Bridge now. Yeah, nice try. <laughs> um, um, but you know, every everybody west of Hoboken doesn't have any ideas. So, exactly. Um, 
so so the you know the obvious um the obvious comparison is is Gwen Stacy but I wasn't thinking of Gwen Stacy at all I think at that point I had probably hadn't even read that issue of Spider-Man mm-hmm. um I was thinking of Uncle Ben mm. uh, I was thinking of the um man you, you you screwed up and somebody else paid the price um uh, but obviously that's not what the audience as a whole is thinking of the audience as a whole is thinking of of Gwen Stacy and other uh female characters uh generally the supporting characters uh in superhero books um paying the price to motivate the hero um and certainly that you know there's uh you look at the history of that and there's certainly some misogyny involved and there's also simply the fact that um for years and years superhero comics were almost exclusively male heroes sure. um male heroes don't get killed off because well they got to come back next month right um and they have to keep coming back. so if you want to you know if you want to um uh if you want to sort of have have emotional stuff have what seems to be a permanent change in the comic um somebody around that that character who's always there has to end up paying the price so oh, yeah. the, the you know so that's one part of the discussion you know the next part of the discussion is well why is that always a woman um well because generally it's the girlfriend of the hero who's put in danger um uh, i'm not you know and the fact that that that's the case is not great and is a much longer discussion but um it's a you know it's a multi i think it's a multifaceted uh discussion and certainly when you know when gail sort of pointed that out and coined mm-hmm. the term and like i'm friends with gail we you know we talk we talked back then about it um yeah. in in great extent to to great extent so um so i don't know would i would i change it it's impossible to say yeah. um uh though i though i will say that you know um more than anything i just stole it from stephen king because there's a <laughs> There's a bit in uh, <laughs> there's a bit in the novel Firestarter that's that's basically that except with a washing machine. So uh, <laughs> or maybe it's a, or maybe it's a dryer. Maybe it's a dryer. Oh um, man! But uh, you know, but that was that was honestly the real inspiration for it. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't want people to realize that I had you know totally cribbed King, so it was not you know washer dryer at the end of the refrigerator. <laughs> Well, I'd I'd like to say that as I think as a comic book community in general, you know, times times have very much changed, and there are you know so many more you know female uh, superheroes and and superheroines and and characters out there that are you know, and and all that jazz. But more than anything else, I'm glad to have Gail Gail Simone on Twitter to go back and forth with you and others because without that. I don't even think Twitter would be worth it. So that's that, that, that's really all I have to say about that. It's uh, it, Twitter is worth exactly what you're paying for. It. Yes. <laughs> uh, and if you're paying for it, you probably have a problem. <laughs> Please st- cancel your credit card immediately. You have the scam. <laughs> Uh, one one last question here by uh, by our 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 former uh, comic geek speak compatriot uh, Bryant Chrisman Pants himself, uh, leaning into your your sports writer days. Who do you think is going to win the NL East? Um, I might have had a different answer twenty four hours ago, uh, but uh, I still think the Mets are the best team, mm-hmm. but they are not playing like the best team. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I think at this point you can flip a coin between the Mets and the Phillies. Um, I don't, I don't believe in the Braves overly much. Um, uh, and I, and I honestly don't believe in the Phillies overly much either because the defense sucks and the bullpen's no good. Mm -hmm. So they have flaws too, but, um, but you know, you saw the, uh, we're, so we're recording this on, uh, Wednesday. Yeah. And the Mets gagged up a loss to the god awful Marlins again, <laughs> and the um, lifeless. Uh, and the Phillies came back and beat the Washington Nationals in the last inning. Yep. Um, because the Phillies get clutch hits and the Mets don't. The Mets left 15 guys on base today. Um, so uh, if the Mets don't start hitting, I think the Phillies are going to win it. Um, 
I, even though I think that like top to bottom roster wise, the Mets are a, a substantially better team, but they can't hit. Well, I will I will take I will take with me as a Yankees fan the fact that the Yankees have a better record than the Mets but are in third place because that's just how baseball works sometimes. And I I, I, re- I rest my case on that. Um, I don't think the I think the Yankees are no damn good either. Uh, yeah, so, no. I know. Oh, trust uh, me. I, I know. I've been to enough games this year where I will agree with you. <laughs> um, it's it's it, it's to to great extent. It's not how you know. It, it's who you play. Yep. But more than that, it's when you play them. Mm-hmm. Like um, like we we need to be beating up on the Marlins and the Nationals. And we're not doing it, but the Phillies are doing it right now. And then the Mets have, I think, 13 games with the Giants and the Dodgers coming up this month. Oh boy. Uh, that's not good. New. No. Uh, so, uh, so, so we'll see. But I think that you know the Mets are uh, the Mets are momentum is definitely in the wrong direction, and they need to, you know, they need to take two out of three this weekend in Philadelphia. Yeah. Or, I think, Panic City is going to start to set in. Well, I'll be at a I'll be at a, I'll be at a Mets game next Wednesday, so they should win then. Uh, everything else is up <laughs> is, is up for grabs. If, but if they win Wednesday, yeah, you have to keep going back. Oh God! <laughs> all about you. Now, to to be fair, I think City Field is a much superior stadium to Yankee Stadium, but I have Sunday season tickets to the Yankees, so I, 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 I think I'll be there more often, unfortunately, for them. So if I'm their lucky charm, I don't know what to tell them. If, it, if we're depending on you, we're in trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, ha- half my family are Mets fans. Half my family are Yankees fans. I respect the Mets. I just don't openly root for them. That's that's the way I look at it. That's, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. I don't. I don't hate. I don't. Let's put it this way. I don't hate the Yankees like I yeah. hate the Phillies. Oh yeah, and just just like I don't hate the Mets like I hate the Red Sox. Like enough said. That's. That's it. They are my mortal enemies and they must be destroyed. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, any any last uh, last thoughts or things you want to bring up? Just that I'm really excited to, to read what Ron has coming on the pike. I mean, talk about my wheelhouse. You got a, a book about Russian intelligence operatives. You've got civil war. I mean, I, I'm Ron, I, I'm jazzed beyond belief for this stuff. Um, thanks. I, you know, I appreciate you guys reading, obviously you and everybody else. And mm-hmm. um look, I, you know, I feel blessed every day that this is what I get to do. Um, and, and I've gotten to do it every day for the last 30, 31 years now and, um, no end in sight. So, um, so as long as, as long as there's somebody to publish them and buy them, uh, this is, this is what I'll do until they, you know, until they drag me out of this office. (laughs) Well, hopefully that's a long time from now. Uh, I hope so. I hope so too. Uh, Zoop.gg is the website uh, for for resolution. Uh, so it goes straight to Zoop.gg, and you'll find it on the main page, and you can go ahead and uh, and pledge to that, uh, and do so uh, at your earliest convenience. As uh, once again, at when this episode is released, there'll be about five days left in the campaign, uh, and uh, we hope to get it to that point. Uh, anything else you want to bring up, uh, social wise, or where to find other other works of yours, Ron? Um, just, uh, the Twitter is at Ron Mars. Um, there's more, there's more stuff coming that hasn't been announced yet, but publishers frown on it when you, when you blow their press releases. So, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, some stuff for later this year, some stuff for early next year that, um, that's being worked on now and is in the pipeline. Um, but, uh, mom's the word for now. All right. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining yes, us. Thank you. This, this was an absolute joy and uh, come back anytime. We're, we're happy to have you. Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. All right. Take care. Good night, sir. All right. That was fun. Oh, that was great. That was a Woo. great interview. Oh, my God. I, I have... I have been wanting to talk to Ron for years and I, I it's like, I, he's one of those faces that like, I always see at conventions and I've never gotten a chance to just sit down and talk with him. And I'm beyond thrilled that we had uh, the time that we had with him. Oh, here. Ian, it was, a, it, was a, it was wonderful. It was a great interview. Yep. Really absolutely. And again, somebody with CGS history, 2006, <laughs> 2006, that was like 80 episodes after I started listening. Like, come on, <laughs> crazy. Absolutely crazy. 
All right. Well, uh, as a uh, reminder, once again, uh, we're sponsored by you, the listeners. That's right. You, the listeners. I'm pointing for those of you who are on audio <laughs> uh, at uh, patreon.com slash comic geek speak. We thank you guys so much for your continued support of the show. Uh, without you, we would be uh, very sad and lonely uh, because uh, the, light, the, light, the, light, the lights would not be on and we'd be waiting for a bill to be paid. So Lonely, uh, cold, and frightened. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> uh, in the corner somewhere or something like that. But uh, we thank you guys so much for your continued support of the show. Uh, it would not be anything without you. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, we keep on keeping on because of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I guess I I guess I get to be Shane tonight. You're Shane, yep. Okay, let me uh, let me bring up the music. I got to do two things at once here. Let's see, let's see how good I I am at doing two things at once. All right, here we go. And the end credits. There we go. Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com. Uh, our email address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. Uh, make sure to uh, remember that our voicemail line is uh, 267-702-6642. Find us on Twitter. We're at Comic Geek Speak. Uh, you can join us at the Comic Geek Street Speak Supergroup uh, on Facebook. So do keep an eye out for that uh, and head on over there at facebook.com for the Comic Geek Speak Supergroup. And you can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Comic Geek Speak. But thank you all for listening and your continued support. We could not do without you. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. Whatever props I could find. I, I throw Aquaman there at the end. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, wow, I didn't screw up the Shane spot. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>